waiting waiting for that noise there yeah okay um we are re we have come to the 13th chapter of romans and uh in interestingly enough it's probably one of the many difficult chapters of the scriptures uh, in general. Uh, we're, we're at the end of a list. You remember we talked about it the last two or three weeks of, of the 25 different ways in which Paul is saying, I'm going to share with you ways in which you can love one another. And uh, he now in chapter 13 reminds us about God's love even in relationship to our governments. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about politics this morning, but I might mention some things about politics uh, to uh, help us understand this. Uh, he says, without any qualification of what kind of government you have, yeah, right. this is a universal truth whether you live in a democracy or not. Verse 1, and uh, again, I'm reading sort of my expanded version here. Our God establishes all governments in this world. Without his consent, they would not exist. For that reason, we who follow Jesus should obey the laws of the government we are under. You know, raises a question for us. Why? Okay. Otherwise, we will be resisting the authority given to them by God. And we should expect to be punished by that government according to their rules. Since by God's design, they rule for the good of their citizens, don't be afraid of them, just act according to the goodness of Jesus in all you do. Think about the government of the country you are in as working for God, servants of God, and trying to maintain a good order to the society. Now, as hard as that is to understand for me, and I'll go on in a minute, but God establishes all governments, and that includes, okay, Hitler, Putin, Idi Amin, you know, and, and the list could go on and on and on and on. Do we have to say also it includes Trump and Biden, depending on where you are in your opinions? They act with his authority. They might not know it. Okay? They may, might not be trusting in him. But God's in control. They are his servants somehow for good. Sometimes we say, is their good what we think of as good? But in the long run, that's God's way of doing things. I think we have to note a couple of things. One, God has not fixed a particular style of government to be the right one. Now, I know there are plenty of people in America who say democracy is God's style. But in the context of this, Paul is writing under the rule of the, government, of the Roman government which was not a democracy, which was not necessarily a nice government. Back to that passage that I read in uh, the, at the offering time, Jesus saying to the man who wanted him to split up the inheritance, uh, Jesus said, I'm not here to be a judge or arbitrator over your issues. And if we go and say, wait a minute, God, I want so-and-so to be elected, is God really going to answer that? Oh, I really want this government versus that government. No, God knows what he's doing with the governments. Governments are, if you will, our issues, human issues. 
What does God ask of us in the midst of that, no matter what the government is over us? To live by the teachings of Jesus Christ. No matter the society. In all our actions, we need to seek to live as he taught us to live because the life of good, the life of love, demonstrates to others the love of Jesus Christ. And the love of Jesus Christ pushes back the darkness. So the conclusion really is that it's not about the government or the condition of our life. It's about the witness that we have towards other people. You might say, what if the government is correct, like, or corrupt, like Hitler was, or at least we have perceived it that way. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a, a great uh, author and preacher of his day, leader in the church, was part of an assassination plot against Hitler. Okay, so I, there's a sense in which if we choose to be against the government, we also have to realize that we might have to suffer the consequences of our actions because the government will judge us according to their rules. But even so, from Paul's perspective, does the corruptness of a government matter? And he says, no. We should live as servants of Jesus Christ, no matter what rule we are under. All leaders should be prayed for. All leaders should be obeyed. If we do not like the laws of the government, in the democracy that we live in, we have the opportunity to speak out. There's a lot of countries that don't. And we have the opportunity to work towards some kind of change if we want it. At least we have, to me, the obligation to vote. Okay. If we do not obey the leaders, do not obey their rules, we should expect to be punished. Nothing in the scripture says that punishment is wrong. Matter of fact, there's a number of places where the scriptures talk about how God disciplines us, okay, for good reasons. Think about this. Paul spent many years in prison. Many years in prison. Had he not been in prison, we probably would not have any of the letters that he wrote to the churches. He would have just traveled to them and talked to them in person. Look at that body of work that we have all the way from the book of Romans to the, you know, probably the book of Hebrews is influenced or written by Paul. Luke's gospel and the, uh, the book of Acts are written by the influence of Paul. We wouldn't have any of that had Paul not been in prison from time to time. Many people we know over our lifetimes have spent years in prison after their conversion. And they have been able to do significant amounts of ministry inside the prison. Is punishment bad? I don't know. Conclusion to me is it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what government you live under or the conditions of the life, whether it's plenty or want. It matters if you're doing good or not. If you're living your life to serve a living God. That's the call that Paul puts on us today. One role the government also has by God's authority is to punish those who do evil by that government's standards. And that punishment can sometimes be very harsh. If you resist the authority of the government that you're a part of, you oppose the ordinance of God, Paul says. That's a strange way of saying it. But God 
established, authorized, and those people put in ordinances, so is it the ordinance of God? Paul's looking at it that way. You will receive condemnation upon yourself if you oppose it. Verse 5, he says, so I encourage you to always do good. In that way, you will avoid the judgment and your conscience will be clear. <clears throat> Which judgment? I raise the question, is it an earthly judgment that you avoid? Is it a heavenly judgment that you avoid? Is it a personal judgment that you avoid? It's, it's earthly because if you do good, very few governments will say you're bad. Every now and then that happens. But for the most part, they won't say that your behavior is bad because you're doing the kinds of things that Jesus taught, to love one another, to help each other, to care for one another. So it's hard to be judged on an earthly basis if you're doing good. If you're doing good, if you're living by your faith in Jesus Christ and doing what you feel you're obligated to do because you believe in Jesus, that's kind of the ticket to eternal life, isn't it? To believe in him, to live by his standards. And Paul says, by the way, you're going to avoid personal judgment because your conscience is going to be clear. You're not going to be walking around with a whole lot of guilt. So love the way Jesus said to love. Verse 6, he says it includes paying the taxes of the government that they assess on you. Anyone to whom you owe taxes, pay them, whether it's money, possessions, or honor. People always ask me if, uh, if, if they can find a way to avoid paying taxes. And I say, well, I can help you avoid paying taxes legally. I won't help you avoid paying taxes illegally. But keep in mind, the more taxes you pay indicates the more money you make. Okay? So do you want to just say, I don't want to pay taxes, and therefore I don't want any more money? Or do you want to go ahead and pay the taxes that come with making the more money. That's the issue. But pay the taxes. Matter of fact, give to everyone what's their due. Taxes to the government, customs to those people who carry a product across the border, whether you think it's a fair custom or not. If you're bringing it across the border, pay it. Fear should be given to those who should be feared. Honor to those who should be honored. It's not about the taxes. It's not about the sacrifice we make. It's about having the freedom to share the gospel unencumbered. I've had many situations in my life over the last 50 years where people have said to me, I could come to your church, but so-and-so goes to church there. And I say, well, what happened? Well, let's just say their dealings in my life and my family did not live up to the standards of the church. It's about the freedom to share the gospel. If I do good in every part of my life, I come back to the gospel and I have not gotten in the way of somebody else believing. Timothy, Paul said it this way in chapter 4, of primary importance, pray. Request on the behalf of rulers and anyone else in authority. Seek their good. Give thanks for them. Seek their best so that they will leave you alone to live a life full of godly behavior and opportunity. 
See, whenever we stop doing good, whenever we stop caring for our government, stop praying for the leaders, whoever they are, whether we like them or don't like them, or we like their ideology or not, if we're praying for them, that gives us the freedom to share. That puts them at bay because we're not doing anything that draws attention to us. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but I, I've talked to police about this. They spend an inordinate amount of time dealing with people who are involved in the lives of crime. They hardly ever have to come to our house. They hardly ever have to track us down. Interesting that they deal with people we don't have to deal with usually. And that gives us a lot of freedom in life because they're out there working with other people. Now, maybe we could learn how to go work with the people that they're working with. That's a possibility. God calls us and have an opportunity to share the gospel. But we have plenty of opportunities to share the gospel in our own lives with the people around us. Think about it this way. We're strangers in a foreign land. We belong to heaven. We're just passing through, wandering through this place here. We're on assignment, if you will, with a job to do. Our goal is not about whether I get my rights and what's due to me. My job here is to help other people with the love of Jesus Christ. Those who are still citizens in this land, which I'm not, to help them see that Jesus is truly the Messiah. Verse 8, he goes on and says, Do not ac accumulate any kind of debt except to love other people. I've always liked that phrase, you know, don't, don't have debt except to, don't owe anything to anyone except to love others. If you love your neighbor, then you have fulfilled the basic law of God to love. Verse 9, he says, look at the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't commit murder. Don't steal. Don't covet. And then, I think, I've got it on, in, in my version. Maybe it wasn't in the original. Uh, if you want, throw in any other command, commandment you can imagine. To sum all of the commandments of God up, is to love other people in the same way you love yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. When you love your neighbor, you cannot do anything wrong to them. And that's really what we're trying to do, is not do wrong to others in our love for them. Verse 11 says, Let me encourage you since the time of his return is near. Be alert to the ways of God he will come soon if it, it is as if the night is passing and the day is arriving. So choose to have nothing more to do with the ways of evil and darkness. Instead, dress yourselves in the armor of Jesus' ways. Act like we're already in heaven, that place we, where we will soon be. Avoid the looseness, the drinking, the feelings of lust, as well as the arguments and attitudes of jealousy. Choose instead to fill your time with doing good and thinking according to the ways of Jesus, our Lord and Messiah. Bottom line, act like you have less time to live here. Leave behind the things of this world. Put on the things of the next. Live as if you're already in heaven. He said in Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 3, look at life this way. We have given our life to Jesus and he lifted us up out of the darkness and into his light. 
We are now with Jesus, who is sitting at the right hand of the Father. Since we're already there, we can mentally set our hearts and minds on being there rather than here. We can ask, how are things done in heaven? And then we can choose to live that way here on earth. Remember the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We no longer live in this world. We have already begun the eternal life God has for us because we are even now hidden with Christ in God. So it doesn't matter who's in authority over us. What matters is the choices we choose to make in the way we pray, the way we live, the way we love, the way we care for others. We have control over that. We might not have control over a corrupt government in a nice dem democratic country like we live in. We do at least have a few options to speak, to vote, to even try to change things. But for the most part, our call is not to create the society of perfection here on earth. Our call, call is to teach others, help others, love others into the kingdom of God itself. So I just encourage you, even though Paul says, obey the government, he really is saying, obey the government so you have the opportunity, the freedom, the peace to go out into the world and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Don't forget that side of the equation. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to hymn number.